Sukhlatin tapped his fork on the table in frustration. Tough! He furrowed his brows and chewed vigorously, causing the tips of his bushy mustache to bounce against his broad cheekbones. Katya was softer. He jerked his neck and struggled to swallow the piece. Sotrapazitsa gazed at her plate with dark eyes and, after sending another portion of meat into her plump mouth, whispered ingratiatingly, I told you the thigh wasn't properly stewed. You should have used a pen, it's softer. Hearing her friend's unhappy sniffling, Shakirova chimed in conciliatingly, Grind the pieces like I did, and drink up. I made up this dialogue between two cannibals, of course. The content of the conversation between the cannibal lovers Alexei Sukhlatin and Medina Shakirova at the table remains unknown. The investigation did not focus on such details. However, it's highly likely that such conversations could have taken place. One thing is clear. Both Sukhlatin and Medina knew how to cook human flesh and how to prepare it well. After all, they had jointly killed, dismembered, and consumed five women and two girls. Furthermore, the male cannibal engaged in sexual acts with the victims before skinning them. If such a story were to unfold today, it would be covered extensively by newspapers and magazines, capturing the attention of millions of TV viewers. However, during the period when the Kazan cannibal operated, from 1981 to 1985, information on such sensitive topics underwent strict review by relevant authorities. Only a few details managed to reach the public, yet even those were more than sufficient. Sukhlatin, employed as a watchman in the suburban gardening community Kainlik near Kazan, possessed a striking appearance, tall, broad-shouldered, with prominent facial features and a thick mustache. He exerted a hypnotic influence on numerous women, particularly those who did not shy away from tipsy revelry. When unsuspecting victims agreed to visit the cabin of this irresistible, handsome man, Sukhlatin, in conjunction with his compliant partner Shakirova, would brutally murder them and then employ their flesh to create kebabs, cutlets, or boiled sherpa. Sukhlatin had a distinct approach for each victim. This pertained not just to culinary recipes, where Medina was a proficient cook, but also in terms of obtaining fresh meat. The mustached cannibal immediately slaughtered some victims, often with assistance from his practical friend. Conversely, others, such as 11-year-old Valya E, were first plied with a light meal before undergoing a light meal before undergoing it all depended on Sukhlatin's mood, the contents of the refrigerator, and especially his appetite. Now let's discuss the refrigerator separately. The neighborhood soon caught wind that Sukhlatin could provide a beautiful piece of steamed loin at any time, inexpensively. Enthusiastic lovers of outdoor barbecues hurried to the hospitable guardian for their share of quality meat, practically for free. Later, it was revealed that the police had received information prior to this. Yet, they hadn't lifted a finger to investigate. How many more murders would the voracious lover of female flesh have committed if not for chance? Out of either boredom or a desire for variety, Sukhlatin began to engage in extortion. He used the faithful Medina as bait. She lured taxi drivers to Sukhlatin's house and enticed them into bed. Then, emerging from the shadows, the ogre-like figure would demand payment from the taxi driver. The profits varied, and the friends found genuine amusement in their activities. Meanwhile, Extra money didn't hurt either. However, one driver, who was given until the next day to collect the demanded amount, reported the incident to the police. Sukhlatin was apprehended, and during the subsequent search of his residence, the passport of one of the murdered women was discovered. As the investigators continued their excavations in Sukhlatin's apple orchard, they unearthed four sacks filled with human bones. Occasionally, a dog that the ogre occasionally fed with leftover remains would approach, Sniffing the findings and whining pitifully, about a year before Sukhlatin's capture, another woman hunter, Nikolai Jumagaliev, began his activities in a small Kazakh village. He, if you will, achieved the main reputation of being a cannibal, though Jumagaliev himself claims he never actually consumed human flesh, only tasting a piece. He bit into the meat from the neck, chewed, and then spat it out. It had a rubbery taste. Such an injustice is easily explained. After a thorough examination, doctors determined that Jumagaliev was insane, in contrast to the burly Sukhlatin who met his fate in court and committed him for mandatory treatment. Jumagaliev's robust constitution allowed him to survive the peculiar conditions of the mental hospital. He outlived the era of perestroika and glasnost, 
becoming the focus of a parade of filmmakers and writers eager to tell the world about the true Soviet ogre. The interest in Jumagaliev's character was further ignited by the unusual circumstances under which he resurfaced. As far back as 1989, while being transferred from a special hospital in Tashkent to a general psychiatric institution, Jumagaliev managed to escape from Manas Airport in Bishkek. A full-fledged search for the ogre ensued, accused of seven counts of murder. Soldiers, police, airplanes, helicopters, and even a group of hang gliders from Moscow were mobilized to scour the region. Yet, the search yielded no results. Jumagaliev later admitted that he found solitude quite comfortable, completely isolated from the civilized world. He subsisted on forage, caught fish and small animals, and once said, all I need is a box of matches, nothing else. He improved his health through natural means, foraging for hawthorn, rose hips, apples, and various herbs. Even animals didn't bother him, and the birds seemed to warn him of danger. He hoped aliens might take him away. Aliens, however, did not have plans to whisk Jumagaliev away, and he suddenly emerged near the government dachas in the suburbs of Bishkek. This sparked an incredible commotion and resulted in sensational headlines in local newspapers. Ogre roaming free, cannibal Jumagaliev returns to society, why, and who will shelter the ogre? He was detained, immediately placed in a reception center and willingly demonstrated to journalists, don't worry, he is not dangerous at all, he is tame. From the numerous interviews given by Jumagaliev during this period, one can get an idea of his life path. Nikolai Jumagaliev was born on January 1, 1952. Although according to other information, the date of birth, November 15th, in the village of Uzunapach, Jambul district, Alma-Ata region. Father, Kazakh, mother, Russian, except for the son. The family has four daughters. And one of the sisters disappeared under unclear circumstances, which raised natural questions for Jumagaliev. But he assured that he had nothing to do with her disappearance. At school, the future celebrity did not stand out in any way. Having reached the ninth grade, he entered a traffic school and then served two years in the army in the chemical defense forces. In 1974, he was demobilized, stayed at home for about a year and a half and, having made an unsuccessful attempt to enter the Institute of Geological Exploration, went to the north to earn money. Jumagaliev's wanderings lasted several years and largely shaped his attitude to the world around him and his assessment of the moral qualities of his future victims, women of European descent. He sailed as a sailor in the Atlantic, worked in Murmansk, Salikhard, as an electrician at the Pechora State District Power Plant, visited Yakutia, worked as a bulldozer operator in Alden, participated in expeditions in Komi, made his mark in Chukotka, Bilibino, and Magadan. He did not stay anywhere for long, maximum two or three months, and then a new search. They pay pennies, and the labor is hard, he recalled. In 1978, he finally returned home to Alma-Ata region, where he got a job in the fire department. From then on, Jumagaliev had the idea of fighting matriarchy. In his opinion, women in the north looked more like men, were rude, bullied geologists, behaved arrogantly, smoked, swore, slept with anyone. In short, they did not live as Islam dictates. So Jumagaliev began to restore order. He chose the first victim because of her promiscuity. He made inquiries and passed a sentence to kill the infidel. The realization of the plan was not easy, and Jumagaliev had been preparing for the murder for two years. Here it is appropriate to break the chronology of the narrative. During the active search for the fugitive in the Alatau Mountains, Moscow was disturbed by a small article in the newspaper Chimes which claimed that Jumagaliev had been seen in the capital and its suburbs. A little later, to stem the tide of rumors and panic, the competent authorities issued a denial. But nevertheless, as soon as the maniac was detained in 1995, to him at once, and what the hell is not joking, from the Ministry of Internal Affairs of Russia, delegated the leading specialist on serial crimes of the main Department of Criminal Investigation, Evgeny Samovichev. Samovichev was chosen for this delicate mission because he was not only an operative, but also a scientist, a candidate of psychological sciences and a doctor of law. Samovichev's conversation with Jumagaliev not only turned out to be successful, but also revealed the unknown, overshadowed by the bloody details of the murders and newspaper hype sides of the psychological portrait of a convinced cannibal 
who appeared in the world on the threshold of the Exequorn century. Yevgeny Samovichev in his notes formulated Jumagaliev's credo this way. He is a wild animal embodied in the guise of a man. The basic structure is the dominance of the male, the law of nature. He will never understand or come to terms with human life. Jumagaliev is the leader of the herd, the producer, intelligent and cunning, with a strong instinct for self-preservation. Even nature is on his side. Having been recognized as insane, he was left to live. He survived and kept his sanity during 12 years in a special type of hospital. Jumagaliev's intelligence and ability to think logically can be judged by such an example. When he was hiding in the mountains and hang gliders were annoying him, Jumagaliev thought of a way to mislead the search. He wrote a letter, everything can be found in shepherd's huts, and asked a loyal man to send it from Moscow to a friend in Bishkek. Let them think that Jumagaliev lives in the capital. As he had hoped, the message was intercepted. Rumors and press publications appeared that the ogre had moved to the center of Russia. The goal was achieved. The hang gliders left the mountains. The search stopped. And what is worth such a revelation? I took the side of animals and did to people only what they do to animals. As for the circumstances of Jumagaliev's story about the first murder, they reek of some kind of afterlife mysticism. A record made by Yevgeny Samovichev from the words of the maniac. It was dark. I was waiting on the street. Ten minutes before, the dog started howling. They must have sensed something. I caught up with her, a knife in my hand. She turned around. I stabbed her in the heart area. I dragged her about 10 or 15 meters away. There was a sudden noise. I lay down with her. Then I dragged her further away, dismembered her and hid her in different places. I didn't burn her on the fire. I buried her and went home, satisfied. I experienced spiritual pleasure, as if I had been going to the goal for a long time and had reached it. By that time, Jumagaliev admitted. He had already prepared well for the murder. He even dreamed of parts of women's bodies floating in the air. Arms, legs, torsos, floating slowly like this. The maniac probably chose the next victim. No one connected the disappearance of the first woman with him. But the next sacrifice was prevented by unforeseen circumstances. In 1979, Jumagaliev fatally wounded a fellow firefighter due to careless handling of weapons. The court sentenced him under Article 93 of the Kazakh SSR, careless murder, to four years and six months in prison. At the Serbsky Institute in Moscow, doctors diagnose him as insanity. Since the murder of a fellow officer was recognized as accidental in the same year, Jumagaliev was released, and immediately, without delay, he continued the case he had started. Later he was charged with seven murders, three of which were aggravated by elements of cannibalism. One of the women he cut into pieces and salted in a barrel. He had sexual contact with another woman and did not seem to want to kill her. He was drunk, lay down next to her and fell asleep. But when he woke up at night, he remembered. Why am I pitying the unfaithful? In the book Black Fog, Jumagaliev read that if you cut a person's throat and look closely, you can see how the soul leaves the person. He looked and looked, but he never saw the soul. Nikolai Jumagaliev was detained, symbolically, with a piece of human meat in his hand. The circumstances are as follows. He was drinking with his buddies and promiscuous women. With one of them, he went into the next room. Further, I quote the speech of Jumagaliev himself according to the records of Evgeny Samovichev. I had sexual intercourse with her and decided to make an experiment once again to see whether the soul flies out or not. I read in the book, if you drink blood, there will be prophecy and the most delicious human meat. She was asleep, I hit her. The basin was to drain the blood. Then I took a few sips of the blood. I used to drink sheep's blood sometimes. Then I cut off a piece of meat from her neck. I started to cut her up. I separated her head and hands, but I didn't have time to go any further. I was naked. My friends saw it rushed home in shock and reported it to the police. He was again sent to Moscow for expert examination. He was imprisoned in Butyrka, and he was brought to the Serbsky Institute only once and for a short time. They remembered me there and treated me sympathetically. Only one doctor kept looking into my eyes and asking, Would you eat me? The rest of Jumagaliev's life is like an uneven interspelocity, special detention center, hospital, release, Retreat to the mountains. Detention again. The situation is really strange. It is obvious that Jumagaliev is deadly dangerous and unpredictable. 
but it is formally impossible to bring any charges against him today. He committed murders, according to doctors, not controlling his own actions, was treated for a total of about 14 years, shock doses of medications, injections, procedures. And now, according to the same doctors, he is practically healthy. The last time he was going to be sent under the supervision of doctors of the Tashkent Psychiatric Clinic. During one of the interrogations, recalling the village where he committed seven murders, he said, It was located eight to ten kilometers from my house. There were a lot of promiscuous women there. I often dream about this place now. Where does Nikolai Jumagaliev roam now? Allah alone knows.